Can you guys hear me? All good, all good. All right, so for those that not know me, my name is Miguel, and I've started this project, uh, well, a bit more than five years ago. So I'll, I decided to uh, change my presentations a, a little bit just because, you know, during this, uh, these days over here, I talked to some people and I heard some of, uh, you know, concerns and difficulties that they may have. So I decided to change my presentation in order to uh, address some of these concerns, some of these situations. So bear with me if there's any uh, moment that uh, I, have, I need to go back on track, it's just because of the presentation was slightly changed. So in regards to the project, who are we? Well. This was initially started by me as uh, the administrator and uh, eventually I had a, another friend that uh, was also with me since the beginning. He's currently not available and uh, is not active, but he still is part of the project. Uh, just to give you guys an idea, uh, basically this is a, an inspired FreeFunk project. Uh, FreeFunk was basically you know, my inspiration for all of this and I'll, I'm going to guide you through it. So the objectives of my project, uh, some of these objectives started back in 2009 when I first had contact with Mesh Networks. At the time, I had no clue what this was. Uh, I well, was actually, I have a, a bit of a depreciative um, point of view about wireless technology. So I was pretty much the wired kind of guy. So everything from 2009 on was pretty much learn as you do and keep on learning until you get it right. So some of the objectives was uh, to create and develop Mesh Networks. Uh, built by the ordinary citizen. Uh, in other words, by the regular guy without any technical knowledge. Uh, uh, in order to provide free, open and democratic access to highways of informational technologies and also establishing a connectivity to other places and regions. So one of the things that I've been trying to do for quite some years is actually to get a few islands connected uh, in this project. Uh, the mission, basically to help people and organizations uh, to implement uh, wireless mesh networks to benefit their communities. Uh, to be independent from a central uh, administration or, ce or a central entity that will control and oversees everything. Uh, we also tend to promote and educate supply technology and information to teach and educate uh, its own social environment about the importance of online privacy, security and democracy. The vision, well, my vision started back in 2009 when I first uh, have, uh, was presented to this kind of projects and it was to unify basically all little mesh networks or all the networks that we had in Portugal and eventually to become the largest uh, wireless independent network made by its own people, completely independent. This was a vision that I had in 2009. Uh, I presented that vision to some people. Unfortunately, uh, they have different points of view and eventually uh, things did not take uh, that, uh, that path right away. Now, at the time, as I said, I had no clue about any of this, what to do exactly, no clue whatsoever. So where, how to start, where to start, and with what? Okay, basically some of the equipment that we using uh, been using over the over the years. Uh, I can show you that one of my first uh, pieces of equipment was that one. We modified quite a lot of, a lot of equipment, and basically by we I mean uh, we started two guys. Eventually there was a third person that helped for a year or two, and eventually it's just me for a couple two years, just doing all this work. And for those that do not know. Uh, there's one detail about this community. It's pretty much uh, a one-man mesh community run from the outside of the country. Usually, this whole thing runs on itself and by its own without any human interaction. Only when I visit, about like three uh, weeks a year or a month a year, that I do a lot of work on it to get it ready for the next year. So basically, this, uh, uh, you know, not knowing how to do any of this uh, demanded that, you know, go back to basics. So I'm going to show you a little bit on how all of this started. And uh, once upon a time, against all odds, as I mentioned before, this project had all the right ingredients not to succeed. In other words, it had all the perfect uh, cocktail of, you know what, it's not going to work. You're alone. Uh, there's nobody with technical knowledge. People don't want to spend a cent. They have no money to spend, and they have no clue what this technology is. So basically, all the right ingredients to fail. I needed uh, to communicate with family, I needed to have a house surveillance system uh, to be self-insufficient and interruptible and independent and off the grid. Basically this, dem this demanded quite a lot of things, starting by the infrastructure. Needed to be cheap and affordable method and on the long run I planned to control the house with a, you know, a smart uh, remote system. The problems that I had, well, uh, structure, infrastructure was limited, I was not on location, Computer uh, family was not computer tech savvy. Nothing of this was possible at the moment. ISP services were uh, quite bad. Um, 
the infrastructure was quite bad. I remember that there was, uh, back in the day, uh, we used to pay for what was called a net line. Basically, it was a very expensive line that uh, provided 56K access to the internet. So it was very, very bad. And uh, low bandwidth and high costs. And I had no clue where to start. So, how about the new network? So eventually, I, was, I got in contact with somebody that mentioned, well, there's a few guys in Portugal that they're trying to set up a new uh, mesh network. And they're already in a couple of locations. So, uh, yeah, why not? So let's join these guys. Uh, the structure was already in place. These guys had some knowledge. So that was a, a startup. So this was my first access point when I made part of the network. This was another project, and my town ended up by uh, getting to know what all OLSR was. The first hardware that I've used was a Buffalo WHR 54S, uh, a 15 dBi Omni antenna, and I was using an old version of the Freefunk uh, OLSR uh, firmware back in the day. Now, the first results, how did this work? Well, uh, when I joined the project, I was very excited. I saw the vision. I saw how everything could be work, could, could work uh, in, in, in ways that uh, maybe some people were not believing in it, but I, but I saw its potential. So I decided to join, made the investment, and uh, started the project with, with uh, you know, wanted to contribute to this project. I initially, I was not going to be providing a, a gateway, but you know what? It was a startup. So once I leave the, the town, this is uh, January, I leave the town, uh, there's some issues happening. Uh, basically, uh, slow service and broken links, difficult access in most places. The infrastructure was created with two routers per access point, having a cost of 150 to 200 euros, which was quite pricey for the population at the moment. The hardware used was both basically a Funera and a Buffalo, and low DBI, uh, 9 DBI antennas. Uh, so uh, if you guys want a tip, one of the things that happened with some of, these, uh, the, some of this equip equipment was that some Funeras actually heated up too much and ended up by burning. So some of these access points that were set up that way actually became completely damaged. Uh, it was very hard to recover anything from some of these access points. So simultaneously, uh, for some reasons that were never explained today, uh, until today, uh, the administration and some local, a little bit more tech-savvy users had some a bit of a clash. Uh, basically, there was no, not enough doc documentation. There was not uh, documentation that was easy for people to understand. Uh, there was very little and very technical documentation. The administration, the group that was taking care of this, was very closed. Uh, the ideas that I propose that today are part of the, the core of the wireless PT project were also not very um, accepted. And eventually, uh, there were some problems that happened. You know, we had restrictions of downloads, uh, only two week working gateways, and the bandwidth was about 30 megabit. Uh, YouTube was basically impossible to be, to, to be seen. Uh, on the long run, after a few months, the users were left in the dark. Basically, due to bad planning, the network slowly degrades services and the network and users are abandoned. This was by the, by the end of 2010, the network was pretty much dead and the hardware just stuck over there. Uh, we also did not have access to administration of, uh, of our equipment. Basically, a lot of hardware just dying there. What was actually working, we had no access, and it was very, very hard to recover most of them. Some were not recovered ever. So eventually, uh, you know, I had to do something about it. I felt like, you know, people have, uh, made, uh, have made some investments. They're very upset with the situation. Maybe I can actually do something. So this is the moment where I started to, you know what, I gotta learn how this works and let's start from zero, from, from scratch. So this was what we had back then and this was one of the last uh, half functioning moments of the network. We had one gateway and as we can see in the metric over here, we have metrics with 25.9. Uh, there's another one over there, 81.27. Uh, uh, we have, the metric was quite bad, quite bad. So most of the links were not working and people had paid quite a bit for, uh, these access points. Some of them was 200 euros. It was too much for something that did not work. This actually led some people to uh, invest it on, in their own uh, ISP service, and that was it. I don't want anything to do with this kind of net mesh networks ever. So basically, uh, I'm outside of the country, and I think, well, you know what? I'm going to be visiting soon. I'm going to do something about it. So during two years, I started to plan uh, how to uh, get the network done. This was two years that I had no access to my equipment, two years that my investment was pretty much dead. So I understood the people's concerns and their complaints. You know what? We just paid money for this. It doesn't work. Now we, what do you want us to do? So uh, a new project was uh, being developed in the background slowly. Uh, and uh, I did a lot of documentation and uh, put everything in a way that was very transparent for the, the, the regular user to be able to understand what was going on. So two years of plans, three weeks to build. So the first time I come back, it was two, two weeks trying to figure out what went wrong. Can I access the hardware, try to fix it? and one week to deploy nine nodes. 
No clue where to start. So there's two weeks closed in a room trying to figure out what happened. I got to give it a shot right now or it's not going to work. So the population was very displeased. Some of them collaborated right away. Others were like, you know what, I don't want to do anything with it. So problems that we had broken and damaged hardware due to bad access to point construction. No one, no, one, no one wanted to spend another cent in this kind of project. Uh, the remaining variety of routers did not facilitate to uniform and standardize the network. And the existing firmware was also not user friendly for the users. Basically, there was nobody with technical knowledge to be able to you know, take care of the routers. And I would be outside soon. So I was running, time, uh, running out of time to do the whole work, and remote, uh, remote physical work was impossible. So I did the only thing I, I could do at the moment. And uh, basically, some hardware that I got for myself, I slowly replaced the damaged hardware. Others I still use what was uh, there that could be uh, used to, to work. So I replaced a lot of the hardware that was uh, used in the, in, the, in, the, in the previous network by uh, Lynx's uh, WRT54G 56, uh, routers. So this was you know, one of the times that I brought quite a lot of hardware with me. So what was used? Well, the WRT firmware. So for those that may want to set up a, a mesh network with this kind of hardware, I had a hard time doing it with, with, with LSR. It didn't work. Uh, nobody could figure it out, not even the developers. Um, it was easy to set up a WDS network, which worked quite well for a while until you started to see the leaning curve. Yeah, after a while, if you go WDS, you're going to see it won't grow more than this. You'll have problems. But nevertheless, I used some old and new Omni antennas. Um, we have, uh, at that moment, I was able to get uh, five stations that would be gateways. So that was an increase in the gateways, and mostly running Link Cs. And at the time, I was able to get a little team. So it was me uh, as an administrator, one electrician, and one public relationships uh, for, to talk to people. So for those that may want to try to develop a project like this, if you get a core of three people, that's pretty much the, the, the secret ingredient. You got one guy that uh, administrates the project, one person that does the, the physical setup, and then you'll have a guy that you know, speaks the language of the community, a guy that's accessible, popular, and talks to people. The guy that pretty much sells the product. It's perfect if he has any marketing skills. So that's the guy that you want to help to uh, potentialize your project. Now, results that we had from a couple of years running this stuff, well, it was usable and stable. The average bandwidth raise was, uh, was up to 5 to 10 megabits. We actually had a link that was discovered accidentally by a guy with a laptop three kilometers away. So this is a guy with a small USB pen on a laptop that was able to connect to us and was able to access YouTube and see it without problems. This was completely accidental. Today we still have an, an SSID that shows up and if it actually is where the SSID says location is, this means 60 kilometer link. So I was never able to locate the person but at least we have the SSID once in a while around. Problems that we had with this setup, well, limited routing protocol, firmware problems that require local physical work. So a lot of times, you know, one of these routers would just fail. Uh, are either hardware or just because it had too much load. At the time, I had an Asus uh, WLGP500, something like that. And I remember that uh, I set it up at one time with uh, 10 nodes, and WDS just crashed. I was never able to recover the, the, har the router from that. It was pretty much dead. It stayed dead for about a year, just because of testing. So this was some of the experiences that I had with DDWRT. There's, a quite, there's quite few limitations. If you want to plan a network with five nodes, fine. If you go over that stuff, you're going to start feeling you know, the problem. Now, uh, some occasional loss of remote uh, administration and hardware crashes kind of uh, showed me that I need to move to something else. So this is when I decided to you know, build something different. So this is what we had at the time, all the links. The orange link is the three kilometer link that was discovered by, you know, it was completely accidental. Still running WDS at this stage. And in 2013, again, one year of planning, three weeks to deploy. And this is what I did. New website, better forum, better wiki, more access points, join the mesh. So one thing that sometimes people talk about in these, in these uh, events is that the community needs to you know, be in contact with each other. I can tell you the only contact that I have with the community is just online. And it's very little contact. Basically, a couple groups where I was able to put people in the forum and in the Facebook group. And from there, I just notify them about what's going on. And this method actually worked quite well and have the community actually engaging themselves to participate in, in the project. So slowly they started to uh, participate more than what was expected. 
So uh, a couple more things that also happen, you know, uh, stable social media growth. We're present in a lot of uh, the major social networks. Node count went up to 14 with five internet gateways. And the occasional donations started to happen. You know, some people that want access. Why was this? Because in the previous phase, you know, phase one, the two years running WDS, I had the need of, you know, I have to have uh, the network kind of closed. So people had access by a white list. Why? I did not know how the network would uh, handle the load, and people that made the investment had to be uh, a little bit more, have warranties that it would actually work for them. Otherwise, they would just completely forget about it because they were being burned from the previous investment. So this, quite wor this worked quite well, and for uh, so, some, some amount of time, people that wanted to join in, they would help with something. Would be hardware, it would be the occasional donation, would be the occasional gateway, something. By helping with something, they would be a participant on the network, and according to their level of participation, they would have more or less privileges. So this ensured stability in the network, as well as keeping it growing. So mass changes, well, we had new hardware replaced. I started to develop the, the kit that would make plug and play easier for the hardware and also organizing the wireless spectrum. So one of the problems that happens with 2.4 gigahertz uh, networks is, uh, you know, the spectrum gets to be full very fast. One of the things I was able to do with the cooperation of the town is pretty much moving everybody that has a home router to specific channels while I would use all the other channels. So, you know, uh, informing them about certain needs and how this works in very simple ways Without being technical, I was able to get most of the home routers to move to the channels that, I, that uh, would be most suitable for everybody. So this way, both could coexist in the same spectrum without causing you know, interference, or at least big interference. This will allow me to maximize you know, the gains uh, of my network. Now, for the hardware, we're still using uh, single-band uh, TP, uh, TP-Link and D-Link routers, HD20 only. I've improved, it, uh, I've improved the, the hardware in terms of antennas, and this was the first time that I deployed a 24 dBi grade antenna. So right now we have a few more, but I'm slowly uh, changing the antennas because this is still one of the old problems. Too many uh, omnidirectional antennas. So they eventually, you know, in some places, they should not be used because they cause more problems than what you can gain from them. I've also started to build my own firmwares. Basically, on the, uh, uh, based on the needs of the community and the project itself, a new firmware had to be developed. And uh, there's a lot of good solutions out there, but I needed something very specific, something that was foolproof, something that did not need human interaction, or at least 99% without human interaction, and could run on its own. And if the non-tech user needed to use it, you'd be provided a couple things, a login, and just type these words, and everything goes back to you know, a scratch, to the default working function method, all right? As for protocol, simplicity was one of the things that I've always wanted in the, in the firmware, so I started to use Batman Advance right away. So the results was actually exceeded. I was not expecting the results that I got, and it was actually, they were actually quite well, quite good. Now, as for the kit, this is uh, some of uh, the first kits that I've done. As compared to the previous kits deployed before by the old project, I was able to deploy kits at 50 euros to 70 euros, an average. Uh, up to today, the cheapest access point that I can deploy it costs about 10 euros, and uh, the most expensive have never, has never exceeded 90 euros, right? And just to keep the basic thing working. When it comes to uh, the mesh itself, the new map, at this point we had uh, 14 nodes. The bandwidth had increased from 10 to 20 megabit, and this is just bandwidth between access points and when there's no load, basically testing it when you know, it's not being used heavily. Now the firmware itself, uh, this was one of the first editions, very basic. Batman was not even included yet, it was just a, uh, the way that I've included it now. It was just um, the regular open WRT, not very trimmed, it was just a testing version and actually you know, provided higher stability and reliability. Also better bandwidth and throughput. The shortest link that I had was 90 meters, the longest one was six, 650 meters. As for hardware, we had five 15 dBi antennas as well as 19, uh, nine 8 dBi antennas. Bandwidth was now between 9 to 19 megabits. I can tell the last test that I've done was a 450 uh, meter link from my access point to the top of a mountain. It provided me 36 megabit link for, to a laptop, to a small netbook. So the netbook only running uh, basically its own wireless card, not, not even a USB pen. So it was actually a surprising link, and I have plans to deploy some access points on the top of the mountain. 
Now, when it comes to the hardware, this is you know, the stack of hardware that I was able to do. As for the firmware, this is 2014 now. Another year of planning, three weeks to deploy. After that, I leave again until the next time. Uh, based on the previous firmware edition, I've improved it, made it 100% plug and play, zero configuration, and 100% self-managed. Basically, once you deploy the firmware, the only thing that you need to do if you want to do it is to change the host name and set up the way it sends logs to you. Everything else is just 100% plug and play. The user, all he needs to do is to go to the web uh, access, to the web uh, GUI of the router, upload it, it flashes itself, it reboots the router, it's on the mesh, it detects automatically if it's on the gateway or not, and it takes it from, from that moment on. And slowly I started to replace TP-Link by D-Link routers. Now I know that TP-Link are very appreciated for, by a lot of people, and they're good routers, however, from experience, and I still have one, uh, curiously, it's also the one that gave me most problems. So there's a few issues with using TP-Link, especially if you're talking about non-tech people, all right? Especially if you need to debrick one of these routers, not all the models are easy. So I've chosen something else, which I'll tell you a little bit later on. So right now, this is phase, uh, phase three, and I, was, uh, decided, I decided to test also a new type of node, a little bit more of a do-it-yourself kind of node, using uh, internal uh, indoor antennas set up uh, in a way that they could be used uh, outdoor. This would allow to decrease the cost of the nodes and uh, the results were the same or sometimes even better. So I'll show you a little video, hopefully it plays, that uh, it will give you a quick visual about what I did. So some of this was using uh, old equipment that was left over as well as new ideas.
So just to answer a question over here, the antenna that you see uh, horizontally, it's not part of the, the, the access point. It just uh, was already there. So this, uh, this access point actually provides quite a lot of uh, good access and uh, gets access directly from a gateway. OK, so about the firmware. Uh, I needed to make it very simple to be sustainable for um, routers that uh, have only four megabytes of flash memory, basically. A problem that we have a lot of times is, as OpenWRT uh, evolves, you know, the firmware enlarges quite a little bit, and eventually all the routers cannot handle with it anymore. So I had to make it uh, a few decisions in order to trim down the, 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 the firmware as much as possible to make it work with four megabytes uh, memory routers for the longest time possible, still allowing upgrades and development. So everything is very basic, very simple, um, and just using basic uh, combined OpenWRT features as well as a very basic uh, protocol on layer two. I also needed to use uh, access points that were able to provide uh, virtual access points. So uh, that chipset was the best option. Um, a couple more things that I also had in mind uh, was zero configuration and self-manage and foolproof, uh, not easy to crash. Even if a regular user needs to access uh, the, the router, you will actually have access to the router to see the configurations, to see how the router is managed without actually being able to damage anything on the router um, in order to keep it working and learn from the system. Uh, in my case, back in the day, when I was part of the other project, one of the things that uh, was uh, an obstacle was we were barred, basically blocked to access or, and manage our own access points. So this was one of the things that I took as an idea back th uh, from that time. You know, people will want to access their access points. They want to know how it works. And if they want to, we need to provide this access. You cannot just block them and say, well, you're not going to do anything with this. We manage it. You know, because people invest on the access points. So they got the right to see what's going on. Uh, also had some uh, security uh, details in mind, so I removed some of the features that uh, usually you can find on, on regular firmware. Uh, and uh, basically, it had to be easy to maintain without uh, human interaction. The solution found was the Link routers, 615, 300N, OpenWRT as the base uh, firmware, and for routing protocol was Batman Advance, um, although I would still prefer e IPv4, uh, it also has a base uh, support for IPv6. No graphical interface, dependency stripped, uh, and compiled with minimal features. As for the MVWRT part, it's basically a set of scripts that help managing the router in a very basic and effective way, and that control the whole thing. And uh, we also have uh, hardened builds uh, planned. In other words, eventually the firmware may not be compatible with OpenWRT, because I'm, I'm aiming to, see, uh, to do uh, something with more security in mind. So this led me to, to build my own firmware. Now here's an example of how the firmware works when you plug it to, uh, to the internet and how it detects if it's a gateway or not. Basically, what happens is quite simple. You set up a node, the router reboots, if somebody plugs a cable to it, it detects if it has internet access, changes itself to a server or a gateway, announces itself that way on the mesh, other clients, routers will connect to it. Once it loses connectivity, the other routers just look for another server, and it becomes a client looking for other servers alike. So these are the D-Link uh, 650C1. So it detects that the cable is unplugged. It changes itself to a server mode. It also serves the remaining clients. Uh, it has its own DHCP server, so it will, re will serve the clients. Now the link is down. It will change itself to client. All of these parameters can be adjusted for what we need, for specific needs. So there you go. Change to client right now. Plugging it back. There you go. Change itself from client to server. Yeah. 
and goes back to client. So as for the interface, everything is command line, SSH, no telnet, uh, that has been stripped and removed. Uh, we can go technical like we do with OpenWRT or a set of scripts will just uh, make long command lines to work in a very short way you, with uh, some user interaction. Basically, uh, it will ask the user what he wants to do, if he wants to change the SSID, if he wants to uh, override the automatic detection of the gateway to manual, uh, whatever he wants to do. Basically, it's a yes or no kind of question, and you just input yes or no, and you take it from there. And there's always usually a link that uh, refers to the documentation on the wiki for people that want to pursue a little bit more information on how things work. Very basic, very simple, straight to the point, using uh, existing features of uh, OpenWRT as well as some customized scripts and a few uh, add-ons that will either they later on to make these things work all together. As for the MASH 2014 until today, we have uh, now about 20 nodes. There's only a couple of them that are uh, inactive at the moment and I plan to deploy maybe three to five more after this, this event if everything goes well. That's the current... Uh, look of the mesh. Over here we can see where everything runs from. It's from this place over here. So the whole mesh runs from there. If I do not have access on that place, eventually I have access in other places. That ensure me that I will be able to connect to uh, the mesh and perform my uh, the administration needed. So five years later, this is pretty much how it looks. Uh, some of the guys from the team, you can see him over here, so that's uh, Pedro, he's still with me today. Uh, not active at the moment, he's also outside of the country, but uh, he's one of the people that's been with me since the beginning, that uh, believed in the concept, in the vision, and, and still, remains, uh, still remains around. The access points that we have here, that's a 9 dBi, that's 17 dBi, a directional antenna, 15, and by the way guys, if you sit on top of those large chimneys, I wouldn't advise that. After a couple of minutes, it's uh, uncomfortable, believe me on that. Uh, this is uh, a 601 D-Link router on a 9 dBi antenna. That's a 615 on a 9 dBi, 12 dBi, 615. This is the oldest uh, access point that we have. It's actually, just, just to give you an idea, a lot of times it's not about the hardware that we, that we buy but the perfect conditions. That's the oldest access point we still have, the crappiest of them all, and it covers most of the town with some of the best access. Only 9 dBi antenna because it has clear line of sight for all the town. One of the things that we have in, as a problem in this town is uh, how the wireless spectrum is used, even by telecommunication companies. It's from, all, over the years, they always had trouble to set up even TV signal over there. So it was always very complicated. And wind conditions is one of the things that I've found over time because I have, I have um, IP cameras on the mesh, so I'm able to see what goes around uh, when regards to weather conditions. I can tell you something that I learned over time that wind conditions really affect how the links behave as well as the quality. Just wind. So that thing that's invisible, a lot of times I would, I would look at the cameras, there were very strong wind conditions, and I would see that an access point that never was in touch with another one directly, all of a sudden, would be in touch. And this was not possible because uh, physically they are not even see each other properly. So I ended up by seeing that the only common denominator that was there was strong winds. Every time we had strong winds, that would happen. No other conditions. Uh, then for other interferences, we got a little bit of uh, uh, rain and the occasional fog. Heat, not that much. So that access point has actually survived most, most of the things. Let's just go back over here. So the wrong button was pressed. All right, so it's the oldest one. That one over there is one of the first ones too. It's been replaced. It seems there's been a little bit of an issue with the PowerPoint presentation. Oh, it's sinking. It's sinking too much. All right, here we go again. So this is a, one of the oldest ones. Uh, the antenna was uh, reused, 15 dBi. This was the one that actually provided the link of three kilometers. Uh, this over here, uh, currently 9 dBi, 12 dBi here, 24 dBi here. This actually provides a very good link uh, with an average of 29 megabit. This is a recent one, above 30 megabit link to 9 dBi antenna over here with a 600 uh, D-Link router. Uh, this was, uh, we expanded at some point. The network started to expand it. I can tell right now, I, I do not know the, 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 the 
date of some of the places that were, were extended because I lost, uh, lost uh, contact, but I did have somebody that was very interested and started to develop the, the project in another town, uh, 37 kilometers away. There was actually still some plans to create a 37 kilometer wireless link between both of the towns. We only had one obstacle, was a couple mountains. But we have the locations uh, to be able to uh, override this, this obstacle. This person was quite motivated. Uh, currently, I do not know about the, the, the situation. Uh, in regards to the project, I can tell you that uh, a lot of interest has, has come from, from the outside. Uh, I would say Angola and Brazil have been in some places that have been interested. Uh, I have some connections there. Some people have been interested in developing it too. This was a very interesting link that I had on my window. It had no visibility for this link up here on the top. So I had a couple buildings and it was providing over 20 megabit. So this is a 14 dBi crappy antenna to a 24, uh, sorry, a 14 dBi to a 24 grade antenna. Without any visibility, I was, get, I was getting uh, above 24 megabit on this link directly. So it was quite, uh, it was another one of those things that happened without us knowing exactly how. So currently I'm expanding links. I'm planning to go on top of a little mountain that I, we have over there. It's as uh, 600, meter, 600 meters high. And one of the plans is actually to create wireless link that goes up to 120 kilometers. We have the visibility and the height, the will is there. I started this project saying, if there's a will, there's a way. And against all odds, I've been able to make it work. As long as there's a will, guys, for those that want to try something new, if you got the will, the way is going to be found. And uh, don't uh, get discouraged if somebody, I was told at some point when I actually met you know, uh, that all else are network, I was told the following words. Don't come to reinvent the wheel. The wheel's already done. So guys, if you ever find a guy out there that, uh, has brand new ideas, has a lot of good proposals, and he comes up to you, approaches you, and he wants to be part of it. No matter how stable you think your project is, don't cut his legs. Work with him. If you don't, you'll end up by being me, the guy that starts the alternative project. That's what you don't want. You want the guy that has his potential, you see his gains, and you gotta work with him to make your project go further away. All right, so a couple more things that we have over here. Uh, for the hardware used, well, I prefer the 615 uh, C1. There's a couple reasons. I'm able to get these routers brand new at a very cheap cost. Basically, uh, very, very, uh, I would say 25% of the cost sometimes. So it becomes very affordable for me. I've also used E3 and E4. However, due to some EEPROM details, I try to move away from those. Uh, and I've been replacing by uh, C615, which I do usually have a little stock. As for the TP-Link, I will keep uh, the 703N for one single reason, solar-powered access points, which has been in, in plans in the background. I plan to deploy an access point at the top of a mountain and just leave it there until it dies and see how it plays out uh, with, uh, solar, uh, with solar power. As for TP-Link dual-band routers, well, we also know how it's going these days with FCC. I was hoping to be, uh, make a lot of use of the 3600. I know a lot of communities use the 4300. It's not much different, cheaper, does the same uh, job. As far as ubiquity, I have a couple of M5 uh, for uh, testing, which it's, the development is uh, under the blankets, uh, so nothing is going to be talked now. And depreciated uh, 2.4 routers, I can tell you, know, anything Broadcom is pretty much depreciated. We had bad experiences in the past. Uh, and generic TP-Link. Uh, again, not because I find them really bad, but uh, to my experience, there are some details that uh, do not make them completely foolproof, especially when you have a, a population target that is not tax savvy. Okay, so that's one of the problems that I found. For outdoor antennas, we still use uh, some outdoor made uh, from manufacturer 15 dBi, some 9 dBi, which I'm slowly replacing, especially the 9 dBi. The 15 I'll still keep. Uh, introducing 24 grid DBIs and 14 uh, DBI planner. Uh, when it comes to other, let's call it, uh, inventions, I also have a testing satellite dish with a 24, uh, with a 2.4 gigahertz feeder, which I was told that gives about a kilometer, but I, I, I have never tested to the point that I can see if it's actually worth it or not. But if it gives a kilometer, it might be, might be good. Now, replacements to do in my mesh, I got too many omnidirectional antennas. Typically, you should have omnidirectional antennas in the central part of the place where you're going to deploy nodes. Uh, having, you know, uh, the, the burbs or the, the, the areas that surround the town or local um, using sectorial or directional antennas, if you want to. So this is a little bit, uh, it depends a little bit on the geography, too. 
that's where I'm uh, uh, moving with my project is to leave the omnis uh, inside of you know the central part of the town and everything around it will move to different types of antennas sectorial and directional uh, for those that might be interested in knowing a little bit more about this project uh, strong presence on YouTube and Twitter and Facebook too a little bit less uh, presence on the other three pin interest pretty much has all the pictures that I've been taken uh, since the project started um, there's a lot more to post, unfortunately, since this is much, uh, very much a, a one-man run mesh project. Uh, from the hosting to the developing to setting up, it leads me, leaves me with little time to address all the needs of the project. So some of the things take a little bit of time. So for those that might want to see more you know, recent news, just wait a little bit. They will be posted. I have a few gigabytes of things to post. Uh, as for the project itself, uh, you got a lot of links over here at the end. Uh, the presentation will be available online. All these links are included with little reference numbers uh, aside of the pictures. Some of the pictures are, will be clickable, so you can get more information about uh, that detail, uh, that specific detail if you want to. You got all of this on, on the wiki. The wiki is very complete. It, can, it will provide you information for you to start your own little amateur mesh network to a very commercial or industrial, if you want to call it, uh, telecommunications project. So you can start from zero to as much as you want to go, all the way up there, as all the information. YouTube also provides a, a lot of uh, do-it-yourself uh, ways of addressing uh, these this concepts. And uh, basically, you, you can take it from there. Now, if there's any questions, feel free to go for it. And uh, I'm available.